Okay, everyone's back. Thank you so much. Uh, we're now going to uh, continue with our very first uh, panel, our plen plenary panel. Everybody give it up. Stick with eight minutes, speakers, eight minutes. Okay, um, our first speaker is Saba Abed. Uh, Saba Abed is a Palestinian American who came to the United States in 1970. Uh, she's co-founder of the Ibn Rashid Cultural Center in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, she has worked with new refugees for many years, uh, taught Arabic at Virginia Commonwealth University, and with her husband, Jamil, is co-owner of the Mediterranean Bakery in Delhi. At Delhi. Saba and Jamil have three sons, and we're uh, anxiously waiting to hear what Saba has to say. Thank you. loving friends. Today we are gathered here to say in one voice, no to violence in any shape or form, no to belittling people because they are different, no to bullying others because of the skin, the color of their skin, religion, ethnic, group, uh, ethnic background, or sexual orientation. And most of all, no to wars. Many of us are gathered here because we know firsthand the pain of being in Cuba. Now I can't see my paper. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Um, okay, we know firsthand the pain of being discriminated against. Also, many are here because they are decent and peace loving people who deplore injustice and violence. Years ago, I had a young African-American painter come to paint my house. And I, I, it just shocked me when uh, I was trying to decide what color to paint my house. And I saw in the neighborhood a house with gray and gray color and maroon shutters. And I was like, that's a pretty color. So I went and said, would you go down a couple of blocks down and look at that house? This is the color I want. He said, are you crazy? I am an African-American man in a white neighborhood, and if somebody sees me looking at that house, they're going to think I am sticking up the place, and I'm going to rob it. So it just shocked me, and, and I, just, I was taken aback. But now, as a Muslim American, this is kind of a, a new thing after September 11. We are discriminated against, and we're looked at as the weird ones, the dangerous, the scary people. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it is, uh, it's very uh, disturbing the way it's going. As a Muslim, I cringe every time I hear on the news that there is a shooting or explosion and pray that the perpetrators are not Muslims. Muslims around the world are judged by the action peaceful and, and peace-loving Muslims around the world are judged by the actions of the few violent, misguided people. These misguided people, in many cases, I'm not that I'm justifying what they do, but in many cases they are just out frustrated with the destructions of their homeland. These imperialist countries come and steal all the resources and take all their, destroy their countries, and then they are surprised why they are, why are they violent. So I think, again, that thing, if you want peace, you have to have justice. Okay. Um, so many young Muslims who used to feel uh, like they belong in America are subjected daily to the portrayal of Muslims as bad, dangerous people. They hear uh, they hear it from politicians on the, and the news, they see it in video games and the movies, and they feel like they're under siege. This feeling is reinforced 
by the increased number of attacks on Muslims and their mosques. Attacks on mosques have increased tremendously, to borrow a phrase from Trump, uh, since, since he started running for president. Uh, in January, a mosque in Victoria, Texas, was uh, burned to the ground. And what a heartbreak for the families of the young dental students in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, when their children were gunned down by their neighbor because the sisters wore hijab. <clears throat> they were killed, and what a waste of talent and promise. There are many examples of bigotry and hatred against Muslims in America, but the examples of love, kindness, and basic human decency far outweigh the hatred. The two young men who stood up to a bully who was harassing two young ladies on a train in Portland, Oregon, and were stabbed to death by that hateful bigot, are true heroes. The racist bigot was taunting the girls because one was African American and one was wearing hijab. Two days ago, a man shot and injured four people in, in a congressional baseball game practice. It was a terrible tragedy. But did anyone mention his religion? Did anyone ask what was his religion? Of course not. These double standards and the constant insult and dehumanizing of Muslims makes it easier and acceptable to commit violence against Muslims uh, as individuals and as countries where they, they, get away, they wage wars against these countries. <clears throat> we must stand united together against all violence and not only when we are affected. We must stand up for each other in joy and sorrow. I hope you can share the joy of Ramadan with me. This month is the fasting month of Ramadan. But for many years, since 1960, uh, since 1996, there has been a, uh, an iftar, a break of fast dinner at the White House, started by Hillary Clinton, continued by George W. Bush and Obama. And now uh, Trump is canceling that. <laughs> well, in fact, the first iftar dinner in the White House was hosted by um, Thomas Jefferson 200 years ago when he had dinner for a Tunisian envoy to the U.S. However, Trump canceled the iftar this year. This was another example of Trump's bigotry and disrespect for Muslims. The reason that the dinner is important is because of its symbolism. It is the acknowledgement of the Muslims as, the intricate, as an intricate part of the American mosaic. His action and words are tearing up the country and the world. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm also going to sit because, like one of our previous speakers, I'm very short. Um, so you can see my little head above the... Uh, so my name is Cassie Laham. I want to apologize to my co-chair, Margaret, for abandoning her for the first couple minutes, um, or more, um, of the greetings. Um, I was actually in a car driving from South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, um, which is close to Miami, for those who don't necessarily know. Um, and it's really wonderful to see everybody here. You have no idea how isolating it can be in South Florida, surrounded by very right-wing reactionary um, Cuban and Venezuelan. Uh, um, uh, so this is really a beautiful thing. I work with organization Power in South Florida. That's people's opposition to war, imperialism, and racism. And despite our very sort of reactionary surroundings, we have been able to put on really amazing events and found an awesome group of people, some of which are here today. Um, I'm also with the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Um, as, as well as the newest member of the uh, UNAC Administrative Committee. So with that, I just want to introduce myself so I'm not just the weird person up here sitting next to all of our panelists. And um, I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Anna Edwards. And yeah.
So, Anna Edwards is a graduate student in history and chairs the Defenders Sacred Ground Historical Reclamation Project. Since 2002, the Defenders have worked to reclaim and properly memorialize Richmond, Shaco Bottom, once the center of the U.S. domestic slave trade, including the current struggle for a nine-acre memorial park. So without further ado, Anna. Thank you. Whenever I get up here, I'm, I'm, I'm never quite sure how I'm going to get started. Um, so I'm going to try and make all the critical points up front. Um, first, I want to say that um, I, did, I came uh, from a conference in South Carolina called Transforming Public History in um, Charleston and the Atlantic World. And it was focused basically on public historians getting together to talk about the ways in which history is being done differently and specifically to um, raise up the history of slavery and the impact um, here, but uh, throughout the diaspora. And um, what I didn't know when I went down there was that uh, this weekend also coincides with the two-year anniversary of the slaughter of the members of the Mother Emanuel um, AME Church in Charleston. And so we were privileged to have members of that church at the conference um, talking about their experience since then, the fact that they are archiving every single gift that people send to, uh, to acknowledge um, and to share in their grief and in their uh, recovery. Um, and uh, it, it was moving. It's my first time in Charleston. I went to the Old Slave Mart Museum uh, to experience one of the uh, most powerful small museums um, I've ever been through. Uh, and uh, it was a good reminder when you walk around a city as, as really quite beautiful as Charleston, certainly in the, in the downtown area, and realize that it's a, it's a beautiful city and it was a city built by slavery. What's become, and I think the reason I've evolved to do public history um, is Shaco Bottom birthed me. <laughs> um, we started the struggle to reclaim the black history of Shaco Bottom back in 2002. Um, and it really became a, a committed project in 2004 after we had successfully sort of d taken on a campaign to put a historic marker on the site that I hope that you all will join us at on Sunday. Um, uh, overlooking the site of Richmond's oldest African burial ground, but also, if you look in the other direction, the site of the epicenter of the domestic slave trade coming out of Virginia. Back then, the reason we did it, the reason we started this, and the reason it has relevance to a conference like this, is because we were grieved by seeing the lack of hope and pride in what appeared to be the lack of hope and pride in the young people of the black community of Richmond, the despair. Um, and I remembered attending a, conf uh, a, a meeting of the World Affairs Council here in Richmond. I didn't really quite know what it was, but in any event, there was someone there who was speaking to the Palestinian uh, crisis and, um, and spoke to the idea that if young people cannot see a future, then they do lose hope and they will not aspire to a future that they can't even identify, right? And so with that being sort of top of mind, the story of Gabriel's rebellion and the way that Gabriel took on, along with at least 25 others, 50, 50 more who went on trial, there were pot potentially 500 to 1,000 just in Richmond that were going to be involved. It was networked out so that there, there was speculation that potentially anywhere from two to 10,000 people were in the ready in one form or another to join that rebellion. He was 24 years old. He was exactly the age of the young men that we were worrying about um, here in Richmond. And we did a program one year um, with a program called the Midnight Basketball League. And that was sort of to give these young men a cultural experience uh, in an, a, a, while they were playing basketball, because basketball was something they could all relate to. They were young men who had been in jail. Some of them had families. And we started talking to them. We started just sharing the story of Gabriel's Rebellion. I was very excited. And I, I waited for them to get excited <laughs> with me. But, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a young man. I'm not, I don't play basketball. I was like, you know, where, where they were looking. I mean, I know they were, they were good. They waited patiently to find the connection, right? But they found it. So, it, you know, uh, 30 minutes into the presentation, all of a sudden, they, they just they took it over. They said, so what you're saying to me is that Gabriel was fighting the same man that we're fighting. And from then on, it was their conversation, and I got to listen, and it was spectacular. Yeah. 
And it was that that told me that the story of Gabriel's Rebellion was extremely important and it needed to move into the public realm. So we thought that because Gabriel was Richmond's story, that Richmonders knew it and they didn't know it. Or they knew a little bit, but they didn't know much. And what they didn't know, though, was the global impact of Gabriel's Rebellion. They didn't know that Gabriel's Rebellion took place in a time when Thomas Jefferson is running for president. We all know what presidential elections make people do. So it meant, so without, actually I'm going to make you all go do your homework. So these are all your little, your little bits and pieces and you can go look things up. This was critically important to the country. Virginia was freaking out because the Haitian Revolution was at its most successful at this point. So we were talking about returning to Richmonders their own hero. We wanted them to have him back and we wanted them to know about his wife Nan. Because there's like no information about Nan, but clearly there's a woman involved, right? And we never get to know about the women who were involved in these rebellions because they're not the ones who get written about. Even more so then, we're, we're, we're moving the ball a bit now. But in those days, it didn't happen. So to give them back Gabriel, but also to say, down here in Chaco Bottom, this is where Gabriel gave his life. So they caught him after he was betrayed and there was a storm. 50 went on trial, 26 died. He was of those who died on the burial ground in Chaco Bottom where you were going to put your feet on Sunday. We could give to Richmond, we hoped, a place to connect with a history that was potent with resistance. We could connect these people, these young men, these young women, and ourselves to a history that connects us to the world. We could talk about Gabriel's rebellion, we could talk about the, the domestic slave trade on a scale, the, the, well, you know the scale. And we could talk about Haiti and what it meant to Haiti to win that revolution, to kick out the French from this part of the world. And what it cost them and how it affected the world thereafter, how it affected Haiti and this country, how we have so many French Haitians, how we have so many black Haitians and black French people. This was a revolutionary period that we're talking about. This whole world was in an upheaval at that moment. And Gabriel was of those who recognized it and took a moment. They took advantage of that moment and they fought for slavery. They gave their lives for it. They did it here in Richmond, Virginia. They did it in Chaco Bottom. And our struggle to reclaim the African burial ground was successful in 2011. The pavement that was there is gone. It's now a grassy field. Our struggle now is to preserve the history that is there. We have had to defend it from a luxury uh, condominium and baseball stadium developments um, three times over. We believe that that is finally over. But what we are fighting against now is the fact that there are people who believe that all the black community should get is what is provided to them. We are calling for a nine acre memorial park because it is pretty much all that is left that we can claim in order to tell that story. And it's an epic story. It's not a little story. It's not, it's not a marker story. It is an epic global story that takes place here that we are all a part of. And there is no way on this earth that we should accept one small building on a 1.7 acre site when nine acres compares little to the 135 acres of Hollywood Cemetery, which was and remains principally a cemetery for the elite white of the antebellum or pre-Civil War period. Nine acres versus 135. The other point, the last point that I'm going to make, and I do expect you to cut me off, <laughs> is, um, is that the, is that we have these Confederate statues, that we have the biggest Robert E. Lee statue, I think, in the country, that we have Monument Avenue, which has been named one of the most beautiful streets in the country. And what they don't seem to realize is that even though they've got Robert E. Lee and they've got uh, Jeb Stewart and they've got the other guys who I can't remember right now, um, but at the very end of it, they decided in 1996, the country decided, or the city decided that it was time 
to at least begin to express the fact that Monument Avenue was a bad place for us to honor and needed to be interfered with. And so the struggle to put Arthur Ashe's monument in, up in the city of Richmond became less about Arthur Ashe and more about Monument Avenue and whether or not to, uh, to desecrate its sacred nature, right? So Arthur Ashe was a tennis player, he was an educator, he was a humanitarian, but what I find best about his presence there and why I, I find his relation, that relationship to Gabriel's rebellion so poignant and our struggle to reclaim this African burial ground, to make Gabriel's story popular knowledge, to make, to make this place available for people to make those pilgrimages that are so important is that Arthur Ashe's statue is on Monument Avenue to me because he was an anti-apartheid activist. Mm -hmm. He fought white supremacy. They represent white supremacy. Monument Avenue was created specifically to tell black Richmonders that the white elites were taking it back and that this was what they expected their society to look like. Those statues have had their lifespan. It is time for them to come down. help us get this nine acre memorial park and help us get these statues moved off Monument Avenue. That will be our, that will be the beginning of staking our claim on the wars at home and abroad because what our work has also helped to do is, is make room for louder voices around the issues that concern Richmonders here at home has to do with housing, has to do with food, has to do with education, and it has to do with the criminal justice system. Everything we do around Chaco Bottom touches all those issues, and we hope very much that we continue to uh, do that work, but it is most, um, I think it's most powerful for Richmond to see this conference come here and to see all of these people who are not just the big mouth defenders um, raising these issues from such powerful places, um, doing such amazing work around the country and around the world. This is not something they've seen before. So you have a special role, you have a special spot this weekend, but you also have a special responsibility. Um, we gotta work together. And, and, and carry this forward in a way that has not been seen before. So, thank you. Thank you, Reverend. And I, I gave a huge speech about being useless with time, and I was a, 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 a total uh, <laughs> jellyfish. <laughs> Although you were one of the organizers, so I, you know, oh. cut, you, cut you a little bit. But anyway, so, um, so our next speaker, and now I am having failed, I'm now gonna, gonna be resolute. Uh, is uh, Glenn Ford. <laughs> My colleague and uh, mentor, Glenn is the executive editor of Black Agenda Report, co-founded with Bruce Dixon and myself in 2006. Glenn is a lifelong activist. He's worked as a broadcast and print journalist since 1970, and he's the author of The Big Lie, analysis of U.S. press coverage of the Grenada invasion. Glenn Ford. People. I'm going to sit down too because I'm not only short, I'm old. <laughs> it's comfortable up here. Uh, it's really great to be at the, uh, what I'm told, is the blackest UNAC ever held. <laughs> uh, UNAC uh, has demanded an end to the wars abroad and at home uh, for a number of years now. Uh, I'm well acquainted with the leadership, of course, with, uh, with Margaret, and I know that the leadership is not talking about these wars at home in just the metaphorical sense, but they're talking about a, a real war, and that's what I want to discuss. Uh, I'm a founding member of the Black is Back Coalition, and one of the uh, principal demands of the Black is Back Coalition is for community control of police, specifically black community control of the police in black communities. That uh, this is a minimal demand. It's a minimal demand that addresses the present stage 
of the historical war against black people in the United States by demanding an end to the armed occupation of the black community by the, by the coercive and punitive organs of the U.S. state, the mass black incarceration state can only be understood in the context of centuries of war against black people. Uh, the regime that the police enforce is not like a military occupation. It is a military occupation. And occupations are a form of war. The occupation flows logically and seamlessly from the wars of enslavement that were incited and organized in Africa. The current state of the armed occupation is a modern phase of the institutionalized warfare of chattel slavery and the bloody wars of re-subjugation that followed the Civil War and which became a hundred year war of terror. In fact, it, until the Harlem Rebellion of 1935, virtually every so-called race riot or pogrom was committed by white people and police and their military against people of color. And when the black season of urban rebellion arrived in the 60s, the U.S. state erected the world's largest gulag to hold the millions of prisoners that they took. They took those prisoners using an occupation force. The occupation is designed to suppress black people's self-determination rights. And the response must be to eject this domestic war machine from our communities and to provide our own security. That is the real and the democratic aim of black community control of the police. The aim is to achieve self-determination by ending the occupa occupation. There are uh, various groups out there uh, pressing different formulas uh, to eject this domestic war machine from the black community. Uh, many of them are pursuing uh, what we would call uh, bourgeois democratic uh, means, uh, that is, legislation through city councils and such. But in the end, the real community control will become possible only when the people make their communities ungovernable without community control. Just as we must make the whole world into a liberated zone from U.S. imperialism. Okay, so our next speaker, Aaron O'Neill. Are you here, Aaron? We didn't know if we saw you. Mm -hmm. oh, all right. So um, next up would be Malcolm, Malcolm Suber. No. Okay. Should we move on to the next? Yeah. We'll, uh, okay, so we will now convene. Thank you, everyone. We'll convene our second group of panelists. Uh, nobody, nobody move. We're not going to do any breaks. Just sit here and we're going to have the next group come up. Thank you all. Thank you. Very much. We're looking for Adria, please come up now. Adria Sharp, Sharp, excuse me, Kevin Zeese, Whitney Whiting, and Rebecca Keel. Thank you for our last group of panelists. Thank you. 
talking about what the wars abroad cost us here at home. Adria is director of the Richmond Peace Education Center. We could use more peace education. She has been involved in grassroots movements for peace and justice for more than 20 years. Adria. Thank you, Cassia. Hello, everyone. I'm honored and a little humbled to be up on the stage, um, but it's wonderful to be with you and um, Welcome to Richmond, the former capital of the Confederacy, the an absolute epicenter of white racial oppression and racial trauma, and a place that was a nexus of the national slave trade, and a place um, where that traumatic racial history reverberates in every imaginable way. Um, the city of Richmond is also the capital of a state, Virginia, a commonwealth, Virginia, that is also very much at the nexus of the country's military industrial complex. Um, we are the state that is most dependent on federal defense dollars, proportionally speaking, compared to any other state in the country. Um, home of the Pentagon, the Norfolk Naval Station, um, countless, countless Pentagon contractors. Um, so we really are at the epicenter here and how powerful to have this conversation here in this space, in this city. Um, so welcome one and all and thank you so much to UNAC. Um, so I was charged with speaking about what the wars abroad cost us here at home. I have a feeling that what I have to share won't be um, terribly new news to some of the people in this room, um, but I will share what I have, which is to say that the biggest threat to the United States is not Russia, it's not Islamic extremism, it's not ISIS. The biggest threat to America is America. <laughs> The biggest threat to our society is our own deeply misplaced priorities. We as a country pour almost a trillion dollars every year into war and militarism while depriving our communities of the most basic investments in things like jobs, healthcare, schools, alternative renewable energy, the very things that would actually secure a healthy future for our children. The establishment calls this a national security strategy but it would be far more accurate to call it a national self-destruction strategy. And the single most important thing that people in the United States can do to provide real security for our children and to promote peace internationally is to work on getting our own priorities straight. So this was the 2016 federal budget so how much do we really spend on war and militarism? This was the budget for 2016. Um, so this is the final year of the Obama administration. Um, and you can see the big blue slice of the pie. It's more than half of the federal discretionary budget. 53% went to military and war, 53%. By comparison, we spent just 6% of the federal discretionary budget on education, 6% on housing and community, and 2% on transportation. Now Congress just passed, last month, a $15 billion spending increase for the Pentagon for 2017, so that big blue slice of the pie is getting bigger, not smaller. And for next year, 2018, Donald Trump is proposing a massive $54 billion increase to military spending over recent levels the increase alone is more than the United States spends on highway safety, national parks, and public housing combined. So this is his, this is the proposed 2018 budget compared to 2016. Oh, no. So he'd bring military spending up to 59% or $679 million um, by literally taking the ax to those tiny slivers of investments that we make, for example, in public housing and environmental protection and other programs. It's become sort of trite to say a budget is a moral document, but it's true. A budget, a budget shows you what your country prioritizes, what it values and what it doesn't value, what it feeds and what it starves. And what we feed most is our war machine. 
And while there has been a little variation across presidential administrations, um, President Obama and the last Congress technically had reduced military spending a little, at least compared to the obscene heights during the Iraq war under Bush. Um, but really, if you step back and look at the bigger picture, that big blue slice of the pie, you know, it remains bloated and giant, um, whoever's in power, and it remains far and away the largest slice of the budget pie under every administration, Republican or Democrat. And not to get too wonky, but just to be clear, these pie charts don't include Medicare and Social Security. Those are taken out of your paycheck. Um, this is the federal discretionary budget, which is like the budget that Congress makes decisions about and allocates every year. So, um, and at the Peace Center, we sometimes do these like tax day leafleting educational actions at the downtown post office where on tax day we go out and we hand information like this to taxpayers, you know, to show people where their tax money is really going. Um, and we get a lot of, I suspected this all along, but you know, people, people don't really know, people think and imagine that when they pay their taxes to the IRS that it's going to like fix potholes or put a roof on their kid's school, um, but it's just not true. We spend far, far and away more on militarism and war than we spend on things like roads and schools and basic needs. We pay dearly in Virginia and especially in Richmond for this level of war spending. Just a few examples of the sorts of trade-offs we make for the cost of just one F-35 fighter jet, which costs more than $100 million, you could build an entire regional rapid transit system in our metro area, which is something that we need. For the amount the state of Virginia contributed to the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we could have instead covered full four-year university scholarships for almost a million college students. And for the amount Richmond City taxpayers alone pay in through their taxes for the Department of Defense, we could so easily, many, many, many times over, cover full four-year college tuition or apprenticeship programs for every high school student graduating from RPS and jobs programs and you name it. The bottom line is a city like Richmond. Well, the body, bottom line is that the city of Richmond has a 40% child poverty rate. So many more investments should be made in our city and other cities like ours. Our tax dollars should be going to pay to repair the roofs of the Richmond Public Schools, to jobs programs, regional transit, foreclosure assistance. We need more quality public housing, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King said in 1967, something like, um, every bomb we drop in Vietnam explodes in our cities. And you know, today it's very much in a very real sense, like every bomb we drop in the Middle East, you know, explodes in Gilpin Court, in Mosby Court, in Fairfield Court um, here in our city. So, and in my work here at the Peace Center, we do a lot of work with teenagers, training teenagers to be activists, um, teaching them about the, the history, including the racial history of our region. Um, and it's, um, it, this week is graduation week. And so a lot of the seniors that we've come to know and love over the years um, are graduating and it's a time of celebration. But it's so sad that over the years, I have come to see graduation week as actually one of the cruelest weeks of the year. Anna mentioned despair and the despair of our young people. And it's like these bright shining stars, these brilliant young people, mostly kids of color I'm talking about, kids, this is a working class and a poor city and these are kids that are growing up in challenging environments. And they've been led to think that they will have opportunity. They've been led to think that if they do good in school and play by the rules, that there will be a hand up. And it's just like this week, the reality starts to set in. Like, Maybe they got into college, but the financial aid letters are coming, and they're like, nobody's going to pay their college. You know, there's very little help. There's even very little federal aid, and I just start to see, one minute, thank you, <laughs> start to see just spare seven. Um, so we're always told that there's no money, you know, but that tale that they tell us that there's no money, it's false. There's an abundance to be had if we had the political will and the people power to bring about a genuine change in priorities. Um, there's no austerity going on in the defense sector. In fact, American taxpayers work 27 days a year just to pay Pentagon contractors, according to the National Priorities Project, the Pentagon contractors that are literally gorging at the trough of the federal money. Um, in Virginia, when you say we need to cut military spending, you always hear the jobs argument that we need defense spending to keep our jobs. And there's a little bit of truth in that, in the sense that if you did pull all the defense dollars out of the state of Virginia tomorrow, the economy would probably collapse because we are so 
or we, it would, the state would be extremely poor because we are so dependent on defense dollars. And at the Peace Center, um, we continue to advocate the idea of defense conversion and believe that that remains an extremely important idea for the Commonwealth of Virginia and nationwide. We've built our economy around war and militarism. And in Virginia, they did it for tobacco. They transitioned the tobacco economy into other crops. We need to be thinking in those terms about um, the defense economy, the military economy. So we stand before a fork in the road. That was very much true before the November elections. It's just as true today and has become more obvious to a lot more people now. We must choose between having an empire or having a livable, reasonably humane society. We can't have both. It is a choice, and there is so much at stake in the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to remember that by her, our own enemy. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Kevin Vies. Uh, Kevin is co-director of It's Our Economy. He's co-host of Clearing the Fog, and he's a contributor to Popular Resistance. That's popularresistance.org. Kevin Zies. Thank you very much, Margaret. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks to the Administrative Committee and volunteers of UNAC for organizing this. And also, I want to give a word to uh, the Virginia Defenders. Uh, the Richmond group that helped to organize the closure and did a great job. We're in a period of never-ending war, never-ending war on terror. In 16 years, we've spent five trillion dollars, thousands of billions of dollars, at a time of record foreclosures, particularly impacting poor communities and communities of color, record bankruptcies, Tens of thousands of people a year, every year, dying because they don't have health care. Tens of thousands a year still dying because they don't have care, even without the Republican bill being put into place. On, on poverty at record highs. And we're spending thousands of billions of dollars on a war that is counterproductive, a war on terror. I'm not going to talk about economics, thankfully. It does a great job. Um, I want to talk about something I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is Martin Luther King's speech uh, about Vietnam, where he said that a nation that continues to spend more money on military than on social uplift is approaching spiritual doom. We are living that reality now. We are living that reality now. I want to put that in a secular language. Jacob George. Uh, an Afghan war vet. He biked down as part of the bike for peace to the occupation in Washington, D.C. at Freedom Plaza. And he's a musician and a poet. He talked about spiritual death in a different language. He talked about moral injury. He described a soldier's heart that killed him. He was one of the thousands who committed suicide. One of the things he wrote was, a celebration of violent deeds puts my heart at unease. Parades and flags can't change what I've done, and there is no honor in what I've become. He described how in every mission, he lost a piece of who he was at every single mission. Well, I, I've been thinking about how this applies nationally. Every bomb that's dropped is a moral injury to our nation. What we're doing to people on the ground, at weddings, walking in fields, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. We glorify war in movies, we show a shock and awe attacks, the bombs bursting in air to glorify our military. We have war holidays, we make war heroes. But this is not overcoming our moral injury. It's not overcoming our moral injury. The media lies to us about it. They create enemies as they're doing now with the, the, the evidence lacking Russia gate. <laughs> leading us to a war, leading us to a conflict with a nuclear armed power. The media hides the stories 
of those who we kill on the ground. We don't hear their names. We don't hear about who loved them. We don't hear about their families, what they did in life. We don't show how we take a functioning country like Libya, providing a high level of government function, and turning it into chaos, turning it into ongoing violence, people who are desolate without homes, people who are turned into sex slaves. We don't show that. We don't talk about that. Frankly, I think we can't face what we do. We can't face what we do, but sometimes things leak out. The collateral murder video, Chelsea Manning leaked out. Showing, showing the nonchalance of mil U.S. military shooting civilians, shooting reporters, looking like they enjoy the target practice of killing people. The Abu Ghraib photographs, the torture memos, approving torture by lawyers in the United States, saying, yes, you're allowed to torture violating international laws, violating domestic laws. Guantanamo Bay, the photos of that. And once in a while we even see, but it's a rarity because the media doesn't allow it, the Pentagon doesn't want it. We see flag draped ca ca coffins of U.S. soldiers. Once in a while, that sneaks through the media. We get diverted off these leaks, these photos, into the next diversion, but they leave an indelible mark. They're not forgotten. People feel them. It hits our psyche, and that's what the moral injury is about. But this is a deep moral injury. This is a deep moral injury. It's not just since 9-11. Uh, one of the great books I, I recommend reading is the indigenous history of the United States. Yes. Roxanne Dunmore Ortiz. And what she describes in there is the U.S. way of war. The U.S. way of war. It's killing civilians. It's killing children. It's destroying crops. It's bringing settlements to their ground so they cannot recover. It's not allowing any peace negotiations, or if you do allow them, lying about them. That is the U.S. way of war. George Washington, much revered, well, he ordered the attack on the six nations of indigenous peoples in New York during the American Revolution. Some of the language, total destruction, every age and sex, killed or captured, destroy crops so they can't grow again, lay waste to settlements, not merely overrun but destroyed, listen to no overture for peace, total ruinment of their settlements, total ruinment of their settlements. That was George Washington's orders. What to do to the Six Nations in New York. In the mid-19th century, we started to see these this manifest destiny, this religious concept that allowed us to steal half of Mexico, to go abroad. We, we occupied China in the 1850s, we attacked Korea in the 1860s, and we already heard about the colonization of the Philippines in the late 1800s. And we've seen it in South and Central America from that time till now. We're still seeing regime change. It's going on in Venezuela right now. These same tactics are used today. We deprive nations of their necessities through what we call sanctions. We can start with aerial bombardments or drones, killing mass number of civilians, destroying infrastructure, destroying hospitals, destroying roadways, destroying governments, destroying functioning societies. Can we look at ourselves and understand our moral injury? Can we see how the wealth of this nation was built, was stolen by stealing the land of others, by ethnic cleansing of the whole peoples, by enslavement of 10, 10 million Africans brought over from Africa, made into slaves to build wealth? Or are we too numb? Are we too numb to see this? I think the job of this movement, I think the job of us this weekend, is to figure out how to help this country face our moral injury, how to understand who we have been, but also understand what we can be. We can turn this moral injury into moral outrage. We can turn our exceptionalism into exceptionalism for humanitarian work around the world. It's needed throughout the United States. It's needed throughout the world. There are many people suffering. Let's become 
exceptional humanitarians and heal this moral injury. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for that. Um, sometimes in the anti-war movement, we talk as mirrors, right? Um, so next up, we have Whitney Whiting. Um, Whitney is an activist, video editor, and producer of a new podcast about pipeline resistance in Virginia. She traces her current political involvement to childhood conversations with her grandmother about human rights and the environment, and to Virginia public schools for teaching her about climate change in the 1990s. Floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna sit here too, because this just feels more comfortable. Um, um, thank you to the Defenders for putting on this event, and I'm really, um, I'm really glad that this was a topic that they asked people to speak about, uh, pipelines in Virginia and the Mid-Atlantic, um, because I've been hearing a lot lately, obviously now, uh, especially with what happened last year at, in North Dakota at Standing Rock, you say the word pipeline and people get their ears perk up now, finally. Um, but I've been hearing a lot of talk this week, um, online and social media, after our recent Virginia gubernatorial primary, that, uh, well, that's, a one, that's just one issue. That's a single issue. I'm not a single issue voter. Uh, this, having this, talking about this in this conference and all of the other interconnected things that we've been talking about tonight already just proves that this is not a single issue. Um, Pipelines, at least for me, pipelines equal climate change, equals water rights, equals healthy communities, equals reproductive rights. Uh, pipelines equal, uh, may equal more money for companies like Dominion, uh, higher rates for the rate payers, because we'll be paying for this infrastructure, not Dominion, uh, in income inequality, and environmental justice, and environmental racism. Um, and I do think it's fitting, it was fitting to have it on this panel, and, and I was interested to hear Anna talk about Shaco Bottom earlier, because I remember a few years ago the Shaco Bottom fight to keep the stadium out of Shaco Bottom, and that was around the time that I started paying, I and others started paying more attention to Dominion as an entity that has such influence over our local politics and our local developmental uh, pl city planning. Um, and that was around the same time that they announced the proposal for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline to come through West Virginia, Virginia, and North Carolina. And um, so naturally, friends and I, close friends, and lots of different people in Richmond started paying attention to this, to this fight. It's been going on for three years now, and there's not just one pipeline that's proposed to go through this state. There are actually two pipelines, and they're almost identical. There's the Atlantic Coast Pipeline that was proposed in May of 2014, and then just a few weeks, a few months later, another company, EQT, announced their proposal for the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And both of these pipelines are 42 inches in diameter. They are high pressure natural gas pipelines, both originating in, in West Virginia and crossing multiple state lines, crossing the Blue Ridge Mountains, very steep slopes. Uh, a lot of, it's, it's unprecedented, the territory that they're that they trying to bring these, these pipelines over. Um, and one other reason, one other thing that's they're similar is because they both intersect with this Transco pipeline, which is an existing pipeline that's been around for decades, and it goes from the Gulf Coast all the way up to the northeast of, of the country. And the reason that that's uh, so critical is because, and it's something that the, the pipeline opposition groups have been trying to, to, to talk about, is that if these pipelines are built, that intersection with the Transco line means that they could export, that these companies could export this natural gas very easily up through uh, the Cove Point export terminal that's being expanded currently. That's another fight that people have been fighting for a long time in that community. Um, but, and of course the companies will say that they're not using it to export. They'll say that this gas is for, it's because it's, there's a growing demand for electricity in this region and in North Carolina. Studies say that show that that is not true. We actually have a decline in energy demand. 
Um, so knowing what we know about these companies, about capitalism, about the reason that they exist, and uh, the need for their need for making a, a continuously making a bigger profit every year, I have no doubt that should they think they need to export it, they will. Um, and the other reason that that intersection with the Transco line is so important, at least for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the ACP, is that that intersection happens in a, uh, in, in a community called Union Hill in Buckingham County. And in, when you drive, when you go to Buckingham, you take Route 60 West out of Richmond and you'll go through Powhatan County, Cumberland County, and you'll, and you'll reach Buckingham. It's about an hour and a half away from Richmond. And when you get into the county, you'll see a water tower. It's one of the first things you'll see is this big water tower. And on top of the water tower, it says Buckingham County, heart of Virginia. And it's so, it's so <laughs> appropriate because um, Buckingham County could become, could possibly be the heart of this pipeline struggle that's been happening for three years. Um, they are also, because they are intersecting with that Transco line, the, because the ACP is intersecting there with the Transco, that's where Dominion has chosen that spot, Union Hill, to put a compressor station, which is the most dangerous, highly polluting piece of the pipeline puzzle. Mm -hmm. And Union Hill is a community of largely uh, people that are descended from freed people who stayed in that area uh, after 1865 and in many cases stayed on the land where their ancestors had previously been enslaved. And they wear shirts, the, the people that are, the residents there that are fighting this, this proposed compressor station, they now wear shirts that say, stop the compressor station equals stop the pipeline. This is a really significant, it's a significant area for, for so many reasons. Um, but also going back to that, that notion that it's not, that this is not an, a one single issue. You know, we have a governor, a current governor right now who has continuously, um, out of one side of his mouth, says that climate change is something we need to aggressively address because, you know, from the coastal regions of Virginia to the mountains, like, people are experiencing climate change in Virginia. We are the front lines of climate change here on the East Coast. And yet he has, for over three years, consistently uh, been in favor of these, like adamantly been supporting these pipelines, both of them. And he characterizes them as part of the new Virginia economy. But there is nothing new about exploitation of people, especially in Virginia. There's nothing new about exploiting land and resources for profit. There's nothing new about sacrificing communities and whole communities of people and sacrificing their health and their lives for profit and there's nothing new about stolen land anywhere in this country. I'm really glad that these, uh, that, and that finally over the last several years we've broken the national consciousness about climate change and about new fossil fuel infrastructure and that people continually are, are rising up to resist it and I hope that folks will um, keep an eye on communities like Buckingham and all the communities that are fighting these these pipelines we, as we move closer to the through the process in just the next several months they're going to be uh, at the federal and the state level voting on permits for these for these projects and and of course, along with those decisions will also be the decisions that community members will have to make about how they resist this. Um, so I hope people will uh, keep an eye on them. And to that end, um, some friends and I have started a podcast where we're interviewing folks on the front lines who have been fighting this for the last three years and we're trying to get their stories to a wider audience so that people will know what's already happened with an eye looking towards the future. Um, which is very, very much upon us right now. So, thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Keel, Rebecca Wooden Keel, is an intersectional community organizer in her hometown of Richmond, Virginia. She's engaged in racial justice, 
LGBTQ liberation, juvenile justice, environmental justice, and conflict resolution with youth and adults. In 2016, then 23 years old, she ran for Richmond City Council, receiving 13% of the vote. Rebecca Keel. Do you have the ability to access these words? Can you hear me? Should I speak louder? Do you have the ability to access these words? Can you hear me? Should I speak louder? Do you have the ability to access these words? Can you hear me? Yes. Should I speak louder? Yes. Louder. 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 understand what it is to live with physical challenges. So that's what I'll be speaking about tonight. Um, that was an auditory challenge. Many folks do not have the ability to hear. Um, I myself do have hearing. I'm appreciative for that, but I am legally blind. I am visually impaired. I am someone with a physical challenge. So. I'm going to be really honest with y'all tonight and get close and accommodate myself. So I apologize for covering my face, um, but I need to. It's how I can have accessibility with myself. So with physical challenges and ability that folks have, I think it's important to remember that everyone is temporarily able-bodied you will eventually lose your hearing slowly, and maybe not completely. Your bones will lose density. Your eyesight will diminish. That is a fact of human nature. Some folks move quicker than others, and some people are born with different conditions. I myself have been born with albinism, which is not a disability, it's a genetic mutation of your skin and hair. I'm not white, I'm African American. Well, I'm part Irish, so there's that. <laughs> and part Tuscaroon. So, with this stance of being uh, temporarily, oh, well, with albinism, I should say, comes along visual impairment. Most folks with albinism are visually impaired in some way, shape, or form. So, with my visual impairment, I have both nystagmus and um, astigmatism, which is actually quite common, but with nystagmus, my eyes are always searching and with um, the stigmatism, they can never actually land. So, again, we are all temporarily able-bodied. We have the ability to lose our abilities at any moment through an accident, or again, just through age. So with physical challenges, there come limitations. My limitations are that I cannot see very far. I have to literally get this close to read my own handwriting, which you can see is actually, maybe you can see, it's actually quite large. With these limitations comes boundaries. So if I need to get this close to this paper, then imagine my difficulties driving a car. <laughs> um, no one really wants me to drive, and I don't either. <laughs> but because of this, I have literally never left my home, Richmond, Virginia, by myself. 
meeting. I've gotten in a car with a friend. I've taken a bus, taken a plane, taken, floated down the river. But I've never had the ability to just get up and go on my own. So many of us are afforded. I am limited to this boundary. I can only bike and walk, but so far in the city and outside of it. With boundaries, and many folks have boundaries, there are our disabilities. I'm disabled. And, and when I think about disability, um, I think about the sphere of access that's out here. Think about it as um, like, like the internet, like Wi-Fi. We have access to it, right? When our modems, when our devices are disabled, though, they aren't able to access that. They aren't able to be in this sphere. They're back here. Maybe it connects sometimes. Maybe it never does. So with disability, there's impairment. My eyes impair me from being able to connect. My modem is broken. And that's all right, because I accommodate myself, and I am accommodated by the world. Now, I was preparing for this and really thinking about what is one thing I want folks to know about disability, about accommodation, about people who live with physical challenge. And I just asked folks to Think about what it was like when you couldn't hear me and you were asking me to speak louder. You were demanding that I spoke louder. It is okay to demand and advocate for your needs as a physically challenged person. It is necessary to advocate for your needs as a physically challenged person. I think that's what really began my advocacy skills because I always had to ask for what I needed. So, I really wish, though, that people would ask me more for what I need. That is a way of showing solidarity to folks with physical challenges. It may not be in the forefront of your mind. Even I write too small for myself. So I, you know, show grace to others, the, the grace that um, I expect to be afforded to me. But it's something that we can try harder to do. It's part of intersectionality. It's part of intersectional organizing. If I am in a space, and I cannot see if folks are in a space and they cannot see or hear or understand the language that you are speaking, they cannot participate. Our movement needs to be big, it needs to be strong. We need as many participants as possible. We need as many participants as possible. So, I'm an organizer, I live and breathe on big paper. When you're on that big paper, when you're on that whiteboard, when you're making that presentation, just increase the font size. <laughs> Literally it. <laughs> Speak up so people can hear you. And there's so many ways to create accessibility. I'm really open to having those conversations throughout the weekend. And I want to end on just saying that we want, we being the disability community, the disabled community, we want our fellow revolutionaries to think more and care for all of us and extend that compassion for all of Earth and all of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And that, this last panel is just a taste of what we're all going to get all day tomorrow. And just a, a reminder of thank you to all our panelists. And uh, a few reminders, we start at 9 a.m. sharp. So that means be here before 9 a.m. Please remember there is no food in this facility, so plan accordingly. Get your breakfast first. There are places nearby where you can eat. Uh, there's a list on uh, the conference website. There's a list of places outside. And if you did not pick up your program uh, before, you should do so now before you leave. So thank you, everyone. Good night. And we will see you all bright and early tomorrow morning. Thank you.